Chapter 12 Ezra had a huge sledgehammer and was swinging it into mighty blows over his head, bringing it crashing down upon Pat's skull. He was bared to the waist and sweating, was dripping off his huge torso as he swung the hammer mightily. His scarred and red-whiskered face was a split of a mighty grin and he laughed, resounding each time he swung the heavy sledge downward. Pat was laying on his back, watching him with fascination. He tried to close his eyes each time he saw the hammer coming down, but his eyes seemed to be held open as though by some mechanical device. It was horrible to lay there and watch Ezra swinging the sledge above his head, and he wondered vaguely why the force of the blows didn't smash his head wide open instead of just bouncing off each time. Another and more insistent pounding drew his attention away from Ezra. It was on the side of his head, just behind his right ear. He rolled his eyes in that direction and saw Sam Sloan kneeling beside him with a cold chisel and a small carpenter's hammer. Sam's face was gravely expressionless as he worked. He seemed intent on chiseling away a portion of Pat's head, and he refused to meet the eyes of his old friend as he pounded away. It was a hell of a way for Sam and Ezra to be treating him, Pat thought angrily. He tried to yell at Sam to let up, but no sound came out of his mouth when he opened it. He had a funny feeling like he might already be dead. But it wouldn't hurt if he was dead, so he must still be alive. But he couldn't close his eyes and he couldn't move any portion of his body. And both his old friends pounded away as though they didn't know he didn't couldn't feel it. They kept on for a long time, and Ezra stood on widespread feet and swung his heavy weapon in a slow, rhythmic rhythm. Each time it bounced off Pat's head, and Ezra caught it on the backswing and brought it up and over his head and down again with a ferocious grunt, and he would laugh. At the same time, Sam's chisel was getting pounded on Pat's hard skull. Sam kept right on pounding just as hard as ever, but it worried a frown was beginning to show on his face. Pat started to tell him to get a sharper chisel. It seemed to him that it would be a blessed relief if the chisel would just go right on through the bone into his brain and finish him off. But he had a funny idea that this was going to keep up forever, that it would never stop, and there wasn't anything he could do about it. Then Pat came back to consciousness. He opened his eyes wide, and the figures of Sam and Ezra vanished. He was laying on his back, and a streak of bright sunlight struck him full in the face. The pounding kept right on, but now it was on the inside of his head. His hair was matted down to the floor in a pool of dried blood, and when he tried to move, he found it was stuck fast. He gritted his teeth together and closed his eyes against the bright sunlight and tried to figure out how he had got there. His thoughts went back to Dutch Springs, in the scene in the Gold Eagle Saloon and then to the Lazy Mare Ranch in Midnight. All right, that, well, that much was clear. He remembered gathering up a few head of his cattle and driving them to the VX herd after cutting the wires. And then he rode to Ezra's house and put on a pot of coffee, waited till daylight before he rode out to try and cut the VX stuff from Ezra's herd. It all came back to him now, though his mind refused to accept the memory. Something was wrong. He thought he might be crazy. Hell, the way he remembered it, Ezra had ridden up and come in the door. And when Pat called to him, the one-eyed man up and shot him, and then walked forward and whacked Pat over the head while he lay on the floor. That couldn't be right. Ezra was in Dutch Springs Jail. And if he wasn't in jail, he wouldn't have shot Pat like that, no matter how mad he was. No matter if he did think Pat had turned against him, Ezra wouldn't shoot his worst enemy down in cold blood that way. He wasn't fast with a gun, but there wasn't a fiber of fear in his huge body, and he wasn't the kind to shoot without giving some warning. And then, to just go away and leave a man knocked out and half dead. There seemed to be something wrong with his memory. It seemed to Pat that it was all sort of mixed up with the dream he was having about Ezra and Sam pounding him on the head with the sledgehammer and cold chisel. He couldn't tell where the dream left off and the real memory started. That blow on the head must have knocked him kind of crazy. He tried to move his left hand, 
and a streak of pain darted through his left shoulder. He lifted his right hand cautiously and tugged at the strands of hair that were stuck to the floor, and when he got them loose, he pulled himself up to a sitting position and opened his eyes again. He was weak and dizzy, and the pounding inside his head got worse when he sat up. He waited for it to subside a little, then reached up and warily exposed, explored the bullet wound in his shoulder. He was on the outside, through the bunched muscles and flesh, but didn't feel like the bone was injured. He twisted sideways, and he lifted himself to his feet with the support of his right hand. His knees were wobbly and he traversed an unsteady and wavering path to the front door and out to the water trough. The sun was overhead, a little in the west. Past noon already, by golly, he had been laying on the floor unconscious for more than half a day. He sank to his knees by the wooden trough and buried his face and head into the sun-warmed water. It revived him, and he made the pain worse. He rocked back on his heels and stripped the bloody shirt from his wounded shoulder, and used the torn sleeve as a sponge to wash away the clotted blood. The bullet had torn a clean hole through the outer part of his arm, and he left the clotted blood on both ends of the hole so it wouldn't start bleeding again. He got up to his feet and staggered back to the house. His saddle horse was still patiently sitting there where he had left and tied by the side of the house six or seven hours previous. Pat went inside out of the terribly bright midday sun and circled the place where he had lain and bled on the floor. He stopped in the doorway of the kitchen and looked the room over carefully. Everything was just as he remembered it last night. That much of his memory was all right. The coffee pot stood on the back of the stove where he had pushed it just after it was about to boil over. He recalled that he was just getting ready to pour a cup when he heard the horse come up and stop outside. He tested this part of it by crossing to the cold stove and lifting the pot. Yep, it was full of fresh coffee, just as it should have been if his memory was correct. All right, then. What then? He had stepped quietly to the door into the living room and loosened his guns while he waited for the rider to come in. That much was clear. And then the door opened. He shook his head helplessly. Damn it, right there was where things all got mixed up. He remembered seeing Ezra in the doorway. He called out to him and started forward, and Ezra's only reply was a blast of gunfire. Pat's knees were shaking again. He stubbornly resisted the memory. It couldn't have been Ezra. He was mixed up somehow. He got a granite iron cup and opened the top of the coffee pot and dipped into it the cool black coffee because he didn't think he had strength enough to lift the pot and pour it out. He drank it in three long gulps. It was strong and thick, and it tasted terrible, but he had no desire to build a fire and heat it up. It did clear his head a trifle, though. The pounding still went on, but it didn't hurt as much as it did before. He dipped out another cup and carried it back to the chair where he had sat this morning before dawn while waiting for it to boil. He set it carefully on the floor and lowered himself to the chair and then got out his makings and laboriously built himself a cigarette with his one good hand. His shoulder was beginning to throb, and he knew he ought to put his arm in a sling to relieve the pressure on the muscles. He lifted his forearm up to rest in his lap for the time being and puffed on a cigarette and drank a second cup of cold coffee. He stopped trying to think about this morning in Ezra. It was too fantastic, and it wouldn't come clear. He couldn't do anything about hunting up the VX cows in Ezra's pasture in his present condition. It didn't matter so much, he decided. He sort of spiked Harlow's guns by riding, riding some of his own heifers in with VX herd. There was just as good evidence against Harlow as there was against Ezra. Everybody would know what he had done, of course, but they couldn't prove it any more than he could prove that Harlow had framed Ezra by putting some of his stuff through the fence into Ezra's spread. The most important thing right now, Pat decided, was to assure himself that Ezra had been in jail this morning when he was attacked. As soon as he was sure of that, he thought he'd be able to forget this crazy memory of being attacked by Ezra and that the truth of it might come to him. But he had to know first. 
The memory was too strong to be downed any other way. He used his torn shirt sleeve to make a rude sling for his wounded arm, and then went out to his horse. He was weak and dizzy from loss of blood, but he managed to climb into the saddle with difficulty, but once his feet were firmly planted in the stirrups, he'd be all right again. He rode to the dun, around to the trough, and let him drink his belly full of water, and then turned him northwesterly direction towards the Pony Express station where Sam and his wife lived. It was only about 15 miles to the express station, and Pat felt a desperate need to talk to Sam. He knew Pat must have waited in Dutch Springs to ride the morning mail south, and Sam would know for sure about Ezra still being in jail. Of course, Pat knew Ezra must be in jail. He just had to be. Pat knew he'd have a hard time hanging on to his reason if he didn't know it couldn't have been Ezra who attacked him this morning. He didn't know how Sam would feel about him after the way he'd knocked him out in the Gold Eagle and used his gun to take Ezra out to the sheriff, but he was too worried about other things to think about that now. Sam had been mad at him before, but the wiry little man always got over it. Pat knew he could bring Sam around as soon as he had a chance to explain to him his reasonings for acting such as he did. There was only one fear that nagged at Pat Stevens as he rode towards Sam's shack on the road south from Dutch Springs. He knew it was something he had subconsciously had been fearing ever since he came back to consciousness after being knocked out. He was afraid Sam had taken matters into his own hands last night and managed to get Ezra out of jail. He tried to avoid thinking about that possibility. He clung desperately to his belief that Ezra was in jail and thus couldn't have attacked him. If Sam had gotten hot-headed and helped Ezra break jail. Pat didn't want to think about that. He kept remembering the way Ezra had looked at him last night when he turned him over to Triple. Ezra was sort of funny. He, he was kind of childish sometimes in his sudden and terrible rages and was capable of thoughtless violence on such occasions. It was hard for Pat to believe that Ezra's anger could ever actually be directed against him, but all the same, he knew he'd be mighty uncomfortable about the whole thing right now if he didn't keep assuring himself that Ezra was safe in jail and couldn't have shot him that morning at dawn. The sun was scorching hot and beat down pitilessly on the wounded rider and the plodding dun horse. Saddled and without food since last midnight, the dun was willingly given his best, but his best wasn't as good as it had been the previous night. Even in his own weakened state, Pat was aware of his mount's condition and held him to a jogging trot across the miles of rolling side hills to his destination a little faster than the speed a man could walk. It was almost three hours after Pat awoke on the floor of Ezra's ranch house when the low cluster of buildings that was the expressway station began to take form before Pat's blurred eyes. The dun pricked his ears and lengthened his stride, and Pat gave him his head, knowing there was fresh saddle horses at the station that he could borrow if there was more riding that had to be done immediately. He was weaving in the saddle, and clutched into the saddle horn tightly with his uninjured hand when he rode into the yard in front of the shack that Sam and Kitty Salone called home. He grinned weakly when the door slammed open and Sam came walking out. He dropped the reins and slid down to the ground weakly and relaxed against Sam who put his arm around him and cursed in a low monotone as he noted his condition. Pat let Sam lead him inside the three-room shack and didn't try to do any talking. He sank down onto a pile of buffalo robes in one corner and muttered, Water. And then he closed his eyes and let his body soak in the coolness of the room. Sam brought him a cup of cool water and Pat drunk it gratefully and then he said, Take care of my horse, Sam. He, he hasn't been unsaddled since midnight. What the hell happened to you? Sam demanded roughly. Where in the hell have you been and who'd you tangle with? Pat waved his hand and tried to grin. Never mind me. Take care of the don't done and then, then we'll do some talking. 
Sam nodded and hurried out. He knew Pat would never be satisfied until his horse was looked after, and that argued about it with would only put off explanations that much longer. Pat was sitting up smoking a cigarette when Sam came back. He had regained his rudy color and looked all right except for the bloody shoulder. He shook his head and winced when Sam offered to examine the wound. Leave it, leave it like it is. You know a bullet hole heals quicker if you just leave it alone. Sure, it's just through the fleshy part anyway. Who threw lead at you? Sam agreed and asked. Well, that's the funny thing, Pat muttered cautiously. I don't rightly know. Whoever twas banged me on the head and went off and left me. He paused and blew out a spiral of blue smoke. I hope that you're not sore about me last night. Sam shook his head and laughed. You were right and I was wrong. Dang it, I reckon I had ought to thank you for taking my gun and keeping me and Ezra from being a couple plum fools. You always was three jumps ahead of us. If I had known what you was planning, I would have helped you. Well, you should have guessed, Pat muttered. Sure, I know, but I got all riled up and didn't stop to think. As soon as I found out, I was sorry you had to do it all alone. That's all right, Pat said awkwardly. There was a short silence, then he asked. How'd you find out? What? Sam looked at him in surprise. What I was going to do. Sam laughed and slapped his thigh. Because you beat me to it, that's how. Me and John Boyd and Winters and Pete and your other two hands after I come to and we talk things over in the back room. There ain't... There didn't none of us have a sense enough to figure you'd already gone ahead of us, so we started out to do the same thing. Pat frowned and shook his head worriedly. Sam's words didn't seem to be making much sense. He wondered if the blow in his head had plumb addled his brain. It seemed like he couldn't think straight any more. First, there was his crazy idea that Ezra had shot him and knocked him out, and now Sam's talk didn't make any sense, and he said... I didn't see nothing of y'all. Sure you didn't. You and Ezra had done pulled out before we got there, Sam agreed. Me? And Ezra? Sure. Them two deputies of triples was still tied up when we got to the jail. Tied up, huh? Pat said slowly, his mind refusing to accept what Sam was telling him. Where'd you take Ezra? Sam demanded. What in hell's happened since you busted him out loose out of the jail? Is he all right? I guess he's all right. Where's he at? Did y'all run into Triple and swap lead with him? For gosh sakes, Pat, tell me what's up. Pat said helplessly, I don't rightly know. He looked down at his bloodied shoulder with bemused expression. I got this here out at Ezra's place. Sam frowned. Well, that's not a very good hideout. First place Triple would look for him, I reckon. How come you went there? Pat hesitated and he asked abruptly. Did anybody see Ezra break in jail? Nobody but the deputies. Did they say twas me that helped him? Well, they didn't recognize you with that mask over your face chuckled Sam, but I reckon everybody in Powder Valley knows it wasn't nobody else except you that could have done it. Pat puffed on his cigarette thoughtfully. He was plumb flabbergasted by Sam's disclosures. Someone had rescued Ezra from jail last night. Some identified man wearing a mask with whom everyone thought was Pat Stevens. That meant Ezra was loose somewhere at the time that Pat was attacked at his ranch. Could it be possible he hadn't dreamt that stuff about Ezra returning and attacking him? It was fantastic. It couldn't be true. He felt a cold sweat break out over his body. He started to speak. It stopped when he heard the sound of a galloping horse pulling up outside. Sam went to the door and Pat heard him say, Hi, Oscar. Mighty hot today if you be pushing a horse that hard. 
and he heard Oscar Penrose's voice reply, I'm carrying the news to all the ranchers to spread out and start hunting for Ezra and Pat Stevens. Ezra and Pat Stevens? Sam echoed with angry reply. You reckon our friends are turning again them? Well, they got plenty of reason, Oscar Penrose said harshly. Ezra's done gone crazy and started murdering folks right out, right and left. Ethan and Nancy Page, old Jake Martin and Ms. Kincaid. What kind of talk is that? Sam ejected. Well, it's true, Sam. The little Page boy saw Ezra shoot his ma and pa. He described Ezra to a T, red whiskers, one eye, and scar and all. A kid like that wouldn't have no reason for lying, and Jake told Mexican Jose it was Ezra just before he killed over and died. And then George Kincaid near got run over by Ezra running off after killing his mother while she was asleep in her bed. I tell you, Sam, I never seen the folks in Powder Valley so killing mad. They're hunting Ezra to shoot him down like a crazy coyote on sight. Where was Pat when all this was taking place? Demanded Sam with dangerous calm. Nobody knows. Folks mostly feared that Ezra went crazy and killed him first in the beginning of the rampage. A lot of them thought maybe twasn't Pat that turned him out of jail, but Miss Stevens, she says twas all right. Sure is a bad mess. You better have a gun handy case he turns up here. Yeah, said Sam. Well, I'm sure obliged, Oscar. Maybe you better get riding on now. You betcha. So long. Watch out. Pat sat very still and listened to the thunder departing hooves down the road southward. Sam Sloan came back through the door. Pat couldn't see his face in the shadowed interior of the way station, but he listened. He, but he stopped stiffly just inside the door and stood there looking at Pat. I reckon you heard what Oscar said? I heard every word of it, Pat admitted. We've done lots of things together, us three, Sam said slowly. He sounded bewildered as though he was groping for words. We've been in plenty of trouble and always got out of it by sticking together. He sounded as though he was asking a question. That's right, Sam, Pat replied. We've done some killing, Sam went on in the same tone all of us has, but it ain't never been shooting old ladies in their sleep. His voice became labored and pleading. Tell me it ain't true, Pat. Tell me there ain't no word of it true. Not Ezra, he couldn't have done them things. Pat sighed deeply, he said. I wish I could tell you, Sam. Y you mean you can't? He did it? After you turned him out of jail? I don't know. Pat paused and then added simply, I didn't turn him out of jail. Sam murmured, Sweet God in heavens! And sat down suddenly. End of chapter 12